Great, hello. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to me speak today. So I've been given the not a hugely easy task to talk to you about a defense in depth strategy within 20 minutes to understand how we can look at best protecting infrastructure and your data, which are obviously going to be top of mind for anybody when it comes to their security program. And uh, before I get into that, just a little bit about myself. So I was introduced as a technical marketing manager. Um, and really, my background is a security analyst. So I started off working for a managed detection and response company, uh, served over 4,000 uh, different customers as part of that, identifying threats or suspicious activity within their environments, responding to them effectively, and ultimately making sure they don't hit the headlines. So that's really why I'm qualified to be speaking today and what I'm going to be drawing upon. Um, and like I said, really um, difficult topic to go into a huge amount of detail in 20 minutes. But what we're going to be doing is scratching the surface of the very different elements that you need when it comes to defense in depth. And just to understand why that's important, right? Defense in depth is this mature security approach that understands that you're going to fail at different points. And what you need to have is um, defenses or controls or measures that if you get through the first layer of defense, the first wall, so to speak, then the second wall, you might catch them there, or the, fourth, the third or the fourth. And those layers of walls are quite a good way to understand that defense in depth um, concept. But also, a bad way to understand them is they're not just walls, they are all very much different controls. So better off thinking it as if you have a wall, you have your moat, you have your archers, you have your barrel of, of, of uh, boiling oil that you're going to pour over. It's lots of very different controls that deal with different types of threats. And you can stack them together to give you the best chance at fending off attacks. You know, Adam did a, me a favor by bringing up the DORA Digital Resiliency Act. And resiliency is defined as being able to withstand attack, but also being able to recover from attack. So if you can stop a cyber attack from succeeding or proliferating further, but also understanding that you are going to have downtime sometimes. They are going to get to that point where they might you know, knock you down for, and offline for a couple of hours or days. Uh, but that doesn't, getting back up to speed as, as quickly as possible, that can limit the impact. So resiliency is looking at both sides of that, which is, in my opinion, a real great leap forward that we've had in compliance, which has previously been more focused on preventing controls. And now we're looking at also getting back and accepting that, yes, you will get compromised. No, it's not the end of the world. So just to set the scene slightly, um, look at the different challenges that we all face. And I don't think this is going to be anything hugely new here. Um, but we've undergone, as an as a, as a industry as a whole, a lot of accelerated digital transformation. You know, there's been external factors that have driven us towards that. There's been a rush towards the cloud, um, a way to get operational efficiencies in the cloud. There's also been pivots from, let's all dump everything in Azure. Oh, actually, now GCP is better for some things. The diversification and, and hybrid cloud environments that we're probably more at now. Um, and that just adds to growing network complexity, as well as mergers and acquisitions. They also introduce different risks. You might have lots of disparate networks with different IT admins who work in different ways. Very difficult to bring those other one cohesive and, and security strategy. Um, we also have, you know, you see the, the, the impact uh, from the, the amount of money that this can cost an organization, estimate six trillion the damages. You know, that's something that, I'm sure, we all spend a lot of time educating um, execs and board members, people who sign the checks, that look, this is an expenditure that is going to stop us further down the line having to spend more money from either downtime, loss of reputation, compliance fines, um, even a ransom if you do go to pay that. And these attacks are getting more and more sophisticated. The landscape is getting more vast and moving fast at even quicker pace. Last year, we saw more zero days than any other year. And that's something that's going to continue to, a trend that's continue to expect to grow. Um, but that's probably because we're getting better at finding them. Um, also, the attackers are getting better at developing them and because as they're able to also improve their own operations, they reinvest the money they get from cybercrime, right, which makes them more sophisticated, more dangerous, and, and more specialized. And finally, dealing with it's not easy. There's an IT talent shortage. There's a security talent shortage. And people are an inherent part of your secure cyber defenses. So that's why you need to look at what is, how can I be most efficient with the budget, the people that I do have? Is it managed services? Or is it looking at a strategy that really focuses on your most high-risk assets and doing a, a threat modeling in that sort of way? Uh, data security challenges. You know, we're looking at protecting users, data, and infrastructure here. But if you look at the cyber threats you're going to have to look at, those are you know, malware, ransomware, and phishing, the ones that people talk about the most. You know, these are really kind of objectives, a way to get to the objectives. Ransomware is an end goal. If you're trying to protect against ransomware and you think detecting ransomware files is going to help you, it's not. That's really much the very end part. That's when it's game over. You know, the attacker is also kind enough to let you know you've been ransomed by sending you a ransomware note. 
really what you want to look at is the attack sequences that gets you towards somewhere like ransomware. So malware is normally somewhere in the middle of that. The initial part might be getting user click on a link. It might be an online exploit that gets someone entry. It might be brute force in RDP or stealing credentials, stuff like that. So if we look at these as attack sequences and understand that no one attack gets somebody to their end objective instantly, that gives us as defenders a lot of opportunities to detect and block them and disrupt their attack sequence, essentially. Which is why when I say being compromised is not the end of the world, it's not at all. You can actually come out in a much stronger position by applying the lessons learned if you catch it um, and respond to it effectively. Uh, we also want to prevent an accidental data loss. People do make mistakes. That's always the case. So if anything we can prevent, we will prevent. Uh, but it's not something you can put all your eggs in that basket. And finally, compliance is a big driver for security as well. Um, you know, Adam spoke, and the last speaker spoke a lot about the different compliance requirements. Um, there are many, and I'm sure that they are a great driver to have security conversations, but also make sure that you're thinking about security and not just compliance, because if you think of security, it's a cliche, but you'll accidentally become compliant. So before we get into looking at the defense and depth strategy, I want to highlight this point, that it really is about people, process, and, and tools to make sure that you realize the potential security value that you could have. It's tempting to go out there if you have a big budget and buy all the security certain tools that are out there. There are no silver bullets. Certainly anything I'm presenting to you today is not a silver bullet either. Um, because in order to get the most out of them, you need people to actually get value from the tools and processes to know how to use this. So I often refer to it as a, um, an F1 team. Right? You get your, your tool, your Ferrari. You might go out and buy the best, the best Ferrari or, or McLaren that's out there. But if you don't have a driver who knows how to get that around the track, it's going to be gathering dust. If you don't have an engineering team with a process to make sure that they are um, you know, tweaking all the aerodynamics, making sure the engine's got all the things it needs to succeed, then that process isn't there, and he's also not going to get it around the track. So that's really a great way to understand this people, process, and tools. But also, it's a wider team, not just security at all. This is everybody's um, concern, even people who might see themselves as not technical at all, not technical stakeholders. If they work for your organization, they contribute towards your overall security posture and your defense in depth strategy too. People can be helpful no matter what level of technical knowledge they might have at detecting and stopping attacks from, prevent, from moving further. So what we're going to look at today, I'm going to dive into each of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, visibility, first knowing what it is that you might have in your organizations, then you can build up your risk profiles and then match that with your risk appetites. How much risk am I willing to accept on these certain assets? Are they super important to what we're trying to do and achieve? Or maybe they're not so important and I can devalue, the, uh, downgrade those and focus elsewhere with the budget that you do have. Then you look at what exposures are there and make sure the attack surface is as tight as possible. Apply preventative controls. If you can stop an attack, that is great, but it doesn't mean that you, you can put your preventative controls on the edge of your firewalls. That'll stop someone getting in. But what preventative controls actually stop someone when they're already in an organization? And you know, being an attacker, you, if you've ever tried any sort of um, hack the box, capture the flag exercise, you'll try five or 10 different um, techniques or exploits before you get the one that's right. Um, so that's what attackers do as well. They get blocked, they get prevented. OK, I'll just um, have to have another think, and I'll go again. doesn't mean that they get them off your systems. Preventive controls buy you time, and they disrupt the attacks. They do not remediate yourselves fully, which is why you need that detection piece in place, whether something slips through the gaps of preventive control, or whether your preventive control is saying, look, there's something wrong. I'm stopping them now. I'm stopping them now. You need to understand how they got there in the first place, where they're likely to go, investigate down that kill chain, have they got there at all yet? Once you understand the scope, then you can fully remediate this. Um, the example I often give is, it's like sometimes you look at, you detect something, you want to fix that on its own. That's like treating a headache for somebody who might have COVID-19. You want to really go to the root cause of why they have the headache to begin with. What does the, the headache tell me about what's, what's wrong here? And so that's why complete holistic detection is really important. And that will inform your response plan. So um, we'll look a little bit into how you can respond effectively. The visibility, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to cover off here. But the first piece is data and access discovery. So what is it that you have? Um, if you don't know that, you can't make the right assessments. Um, I once had a, a customer um, had a WordPress website that was compromised, and I told them about it, and they said, well, you must have put that there because that's not us. But they didn't know for, for however many years that they'd had that running, and they'd been fine, and they didn't know they'd inherited that, and they hadn't been managing it. So that's sort of starts with a basic tenor, but know what you've got so you can secure it. And once you then understand what you've got, you can classify that. What data do I have that's super sensitive? Um, what data do I have that's confidential? You know, almost everything is sensitive to a degree, but what level of sensitivity is it? That lets you then build out the strategies of the controls you're going to apply to them. Same for your assets. You can group them by 
what would happen if they were compromised, but also what functions they perform. Are they Linux machines? Are they web servers? When you then have a, a Linux-based threat come in, you can look at all of your Linux machines and make sure you're applying those uh, hardening mitigations or, or controls across your entire environment. And then you want to scan the assets that you have so you understand what, what holes are available to the attacker. Give that outside in look. What can they see from the outside? What can they see if they had access to the machine? So then you're understanding the ways an attacker could get to those, those goals, those objectives of ransomware or data exfiltration. If you get a pen test, this is like a much more sophisticated vulnerability scan. It's where you'll actually have intelligent hands-on keyboards, somebody prodding and poking these holes, um, getting to that final objective. This is a fantastic way to justify um, any, any risk to, to, to the board or any of your employees. Look, because this is shows in a safe way how somebody got from A to B to C to D to your um, critical infrastructure or to your um, database holding your intellectual property. And um, there's no better impetus than a pen test report to go and fix some of your security issues. Uh, so they'll simulate the adversaries. We also have the risk assessment. So after you have all this information, you can understand what's important to you. Does it matter where the red team got? If not, then you can not have to prioritize as much. But you need to just really make sure that you're applying the business context that you have and other stakeholders have to your environment when you're doing your security uh, strategy. And finally, we need to monitor this, make sure that we understand um, all of the different, you know, all, what all our systems are doing at any point. If the XDR debate was really high previously, uh, XDR or SIEM can both give you insight into all of the assets in your environment, what they're talking to, what they're doing, what they're behaving like, so that when something does go wrong, you can not only be alerted to it, but you can investigate exactly how far that, that happened. So exposure management, so uh, for some reason, one of the colors of notice isn't coming up on number six, but there is supposed to be something there, but that's just superficial. So when you're looking to understand what it is you have and all the different risks that are present on there, or how they could be realized, those risks, now we're going to make sure we reduce that attack surface as much as possible. So that's by patching your systems. That's by looking at your identity. What password power policies can you have? Single sign-on, can you adopt that elsewhere? Make sure you're limiting the attack surface to as, many, as few controls and technologies as possible, because then you can apply better hardening and mitigation techniques on top of them. Same for configurations in your cloud. You know, Telling, configuring something is just as bad as running a vulnerable version. In fact, sometimes it's that low-hanging fruit that attackers get into. I used to think that cyber attacks would always be something really sophisticated and interesting. Half the time, it was somebody just leaving a door wide open because you know devs get frustrated, they can't work out why something doesn't work, and they just go on and end up to disable control entirely or allow something in. You know, I think we've all had that temptation at times, uh, and that can leave you really vulnerable to allow someone to just walk in through, through the front door, so to speak. Privilege access management, your privileged accounts, they are the, the kings of your castle. If someone's able to compromise those, they have access to as much of the, the network as that privileged account has access to. Think of your IT admins. They're able to log into all of your um, employees' assets, um, endpoints, laptops, and control them. If someone's to compromise that account, might see what scope they would have there. So make sure you make sure that the access is limited as much as possible, and people who have access, that is controlled, audited, and monitored as well. And finally, this isn't a point in time exercise. This is something you have to do and revisit continuously. Um, technology changes. We want to adopt the latest technology. Maybe the, the platform as a service is what's something great out there, loads, as there loads of efficiencies. That also might create a difference in the tax surface. So you need to revisit that and make sure that you, you're, you're reassessing what your exposures are and what your risk is. Now, prevention controls. I talked about how these um, aren't, don't put all your eggs in this basket, but of course, you'd be foolish not to invest in preventative controls because they can buy you time and they can stop certain attacks dead in their tracks. So data loss prevention, um, really this often, more often than not, captures the mistakes people make when they share something, say on WeTransfer, you know, just trying to get a file out there. Um, somebody's, that's hosted somewhere else externally for part of the WeTransfer to make that, that connection. So that, that's a really bad practice, but something people might not know about. So rather than educate them, something like DLP will actually block them from doing that and prevent them from going down that route. And if it's an attacker, it might stop them exfiltrating data in different methods. Digital rights management, this is about what you can do with the different inf data and information that you have. Um, I actually studied law once upon a time, and we learned uh, with, in copyright law, if you open up a book, it says that you have, you have the right to read this book. You do not have the right to um, the audio rights to it which means you can't actually read that book out loud. And that's, 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 that's illegal, essentially, because it's derivative of the initial copyright, which you don't have access to. Digital rights management is even better because it would physically stop your mouth from being able to read, speak that out. You know, it stops you bypassing what you're supposed to do. It is a control that means that if you have access to this, you're the only person who has access to this, you can't share it with those people who don't have access to it. And also, it can be clawed back and pulled back um, if, if you no longer 
need to have um, rights to that, that asset. Secure flyer file transfer, so uh, use that we transfer example. This is the alternative. This is using a, a secure file transfer protocol that's going to encrypt your data and send it through um, at the appropriate um, location and securely. Web application firewall or WAF. This blocks the attacks that are on your, uh, your, towards your web applications. This is your most targeted assets. So think of your websites, the easy example, but also your customer portals. Maybe even your SharePoint could be considered a web app, right? They are exposed to the internet in order to make them work for you and your customers, which means they are super vulnerable. Uh, so, sorry, not vulnerable. They're super exposed. They're essentially, say, you know, they're there for anybody to access. They're constantly being hammered and targeted. And as a consequence, they also, uh, the, pro the majority of server-based um, compromises begin with web apps not with your desktops and users stations, um, which is contrary to, to what a lot of people might, might perceive. This brings on to endpoint protection. You know, users are targeted a lot. They also make a lot of mistakes, so they do warrant those types of controls to, when they click on a phishing email, block that type of malware. And finally, email and phish protection you can make sure that those emails are identified that could potentially be risks to your employees, redacted um, so they can't click on the malicious links or maybe perform some education around them so that they never click on that link that either steals their credentials, drops malware on the machine, or even worse, perhaps, um, they, they send off an invoice, they, they respond to an invoice and direct all of your funds to this malicious uh, bank account, which they're never going to get the money back from again. And detection. So once we rely upon that detention is not going to stop everything, we need to make sure we have eyes on, on, on the data continuously, 24-7, 365. And threat intelligence, if you think of that F1 example I used earlier, threat intelligence is the fuel that drives you forward. Um, attackers are constantly developing new techniques. Zero days have the greatest chance of attack because they are zero days since anybody knows about them. So people are always playing cat and mouse in that state where well, we are the cat as defenders and they are the mouse, so they have that advantage where they, they, can, they have a head start on us, so to speak. So threat intelligence makes sure you keep pace with that and able to, to stay, stay current. Siemens XDR aggregates all the data from all the different data sources that you have. You can form analytics on it, so it says, here's something that you might want to go and investigate. You know, there is a lot of false positives. Those are a necessary evil, let me tell you. If you're not getting false positives, you're not monitoring enough, uh, but unfortunately, you don't want to, you have to balance that, that scale, not have too many, because then that can be distracting and a waste of, of valuable um, um, resources. File integrity monitoring, so what files do you have on your machines? Are they being modified? And I don't mean just somebody changing your work and, um, and altering something that's in there, but actually uh, maybe the configuration files on your web server, maybe your scheduled tasks on your Windows machine or your Linux machine, cron jobs. This is where the attackers like to edit and embed themselves in. So if you get rid of them from your machine, but you've left a scheduled task that's got their, their modification within there, the next day it becomes reinfected. So again, back to that point of addressing the compromise holistically and not just looking at a single symptom and thinking that we've dealt with everything. Um, IDS is about looking at your network visibility. So logs is normally what people start with, but IDS complement logs in that it performs deep packet inspection. So it sees everything that's traversing the wire. I can understand what somebody, what a connection that's being made and what the response is. Really essential to provide that visibility where if you're a security analyst, you can make accurate assessments. Logs sometimes will tell you there's been an attack. They can't tell you if it's been successful or not. Network you, traffic, you can see the exact response to that. So it gives you that confidence and accuracy of responding. Um, I think I'm going to pick up the pace slightly, but detection is really all about understanding what's your mean time to detect an incident. That's a great metric to measure yourselves by. How quickly can you detect uh, malicious activity when it occurs? If you, if you evaluate that and use all, look at all these different elements that can help you lower that metric, that's a great place to start and leads us directly into response, which is that mean time to respond metric. So how quickly can I respond? If you respond to something quickly, uh, then you are going to come out with it much, much more secure, you're going to limit the impact an attacker is actually able to achieve. People who tend to hit the news, um, you know, the ransomware particularly, that tends to be attack sequences of three weeks to, to months. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to respond and disrupt these attack sequences. How are we doing for time? <laughs> We're not finished yet, no. I've got a few more to get through. I just where there's not a clock up here. I don't know, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, forgive me. All right. Great. Well, um, apologies. Just your last. Sure. That's okay. Sure. Great. So, response. Uh, you know, coming off the response. Then I look at a little bit. So I kind of knew I was going to dive into more detail on some of these things than I needed to because defense in depth is really about understand what it is that you have and 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 then applying the controls appropriate for you. It's difficult to if you're going to cover that quickly. 
But with Fortra, what we're looking to do is bring in together lots of different uh, security controls and services and connect them together so they're able to share the threat intelligence that, that, is, um, that it makes them all run and also offer di a different defense points for different types of threats that can really work together and talk to each other. Um, so I'll leave you with a little highlight of um, some of the different technologies that we have around addressing your, your, your threats, um, whether it's your exposures, your vulnerabilities, and whether it's the um, file transfers that you need to look at, or whether it's your email security, and also then onto infrastructure protection, that adversarial simulation, doing things like pen testing with Cobalt Strike um, or manage pen testing with core security so that you can then understand your, your risk posture and then detect these threats, something like a managed detection response solution or with it, your file integrity monitoring. So apologies for running over. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed.